I'd like to now introduce our panel. We have Dr. Jonathan Chu, who is a professor of history at UMass Boston and the editor of the New England Quarterly. Jonathan has also written on the teaching of US history, has chaired the Test Development Committee for the AP US History Test, and has served as chief reader for the AP US History Test. He is also, in his spare time, the vice chairman of the board of directors of Old North Illuminated and the chair of our education committee. Dr. Jamie Crumley is the research fellow this year at Old North. Jamie is an assistant professor in gender studies and ethnic studies at the University of Utah. She holds a master's in divinity and a master's in sacred theology from Yale Divinity School. Emily Spence is our digital resource and curriculum manager at Old North. Before joining the full-time staff, Emily taught middle school history, language arts, music, and religion, and has taught public history at places like Colonial Williamsburg and Sturbridge. So, we're going to dive in now. What do we mean when we say hard history? So I'm gonna to try to define this, and then we're going to have some questions and our panelists are gonna talk. You don't have to listen to me. Hard history deals with complicated subject matters. It demands critical thinking and the ability to accept that there may not be simple answers. There can be an emotional element, too, to teaching hard history because it raises topics that challenge perspectives and power structures and attitudes. I want to quote historian and author Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who wrote, we the people have a deep-seated aversion to hard history because we're uncomfortable with the implications it raises for the past as well as the present. So, if hard history means moving past a kind of tidy, clear-cut view of people, places, and events, moving away from a true, not true, good, bad perspective into a place that allows for messiness, flaws, and contradiction, how do we deal with the contradictions we find in the historical record? How can and should we teach about the messiness of places like Old North and of people and the positive and negative aspects of their past? What, if any, role is there for making judgments or for reacting emotionally? And Jamie, I'm handing it over to you. Okay, I think it's all beautiful. Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction and for telling us more about what hard history is. And thank you to all of you for being here this evening. <laughs> Earlier today, I was at the Massachusetts Historical Society, as I usually am on Wednesdays. And um, I was going through our church records. And of course, the name Faneuil, which you all probably know, Faneuil Hall, right down the street from us, that name comes up a lot in our early church records. Um, because Andrew Faneuil and later his nephew Peter uh, contributed a lot financially um, to the early life of this church. And so I always just look up the Faneuil family. Uh, their records are not held at the MHS, they're held at Harvard, um, and a lot of them are digitized if you're curious. And so, you know, I love to just go on the blogs and see what people are writing about certain things. And they wrote, um, there was an article that I found, a blog post from 2018 that was about the Faneuil family and about how much they had, um, about how when Faneuil Hall was built, um, how much it relied on, of course, Peter Faneuil's money, which of course he had largely gotten through his participation in the transatlantic slave trade. So basically the purpose of the article was to say, part of the reason why we have Faneuil Hall even today is because of the profits that were made from the transatlantic slave trade. So under this blog post, there was exactly one response. And I'm going to read, I'm gonna redact it a little bit, but I'm gonna read some of it. It says, our nation's capital is named after a guy who owned a plantation worked by slaves. The time has come to rename Washington DC and posthumously impeach the first president for doing something that was still legal at the time. 
And later the, the person, the snarky person, writes, they conclude, it's about time we punish those long dead people for not being perfect like the leaders we have now. So of course, this is a very snarky response to a very serious problem. So what I liked about this person's comment is that in part, they're correct. We can't go back and punish people in the past for things that they did, which we now in retrospect think are wrong. However, what we can do is to think about how that past is completely tied in with our present. How these systems of economic and social inequality that were set up 300 years ago are still with us today and the ways that those are still a problem for us today. So my training is as a scholar of race and gender. My training has been primarily in the field of gender studies, but I've been trained by black women's historians and black feminist theorists. And so part of what we do is approach the history of the past a bit at a slant, which means that like the original um, leaders of black feminism here in Boston wrote in the Combahee River Collective Statement in 1969. What that means is to dismantle systems of racism, heterosexism, classism, and sexism. And so when I approach the historical record, I think about how we can decenter heterosexism. How can we decenter wealth? How can we decenter cisgender identity? How can we decenter masculinity? How can we decenter whiteness in a way that we can see all people as lovely human? So the truth of the matter is not that all black people who existed here in the 18th century were perfect people and we have to valorize every story. That's not the truth. The truth is not that every indigenous person who has ever existed in Boston's history has been perfect and we have to valorize them no matter what. And the truth is the same for every other group who we might write about or think about historically. And so how can we decenter what we think of as right or good or a noble or worthy story and think differently about our approach to the past in such a way that it makes us into better humans in the present by unraveling all of these things that we were taught were normal and right and good, which is part of what we do with the study of history we can become better and make better choices in our present. Thank you, Jamie. Um, that kind of leads to another question, which I think, Jonathan, you are going to be answering, which is how do hard histories connect to the inclusion of underrepresented people and communities? One, there are two stories I want to tell that speak to this. The first is a story, probably apocryphal. Um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, second, third tier German philosopher, was walking across his campus one day. A student came rushing up to him and said, Master, how could the ancients have been so foolish as to have thought that the sun revolved around the earth? Wittgenstein paused. He looked up at the sun and said it must have looked different then. In some ways, that's what historians are trained to do, to ask questions about why things looked different then. And when we do that, I think that goes a long way if we're honest about it, and, and that's what makes history hard. If we're honest about it, we realize that all too often the narrative that we receive is the narrative that's been privileged, well, the story is the victors write the history. Um, but as Jamie points out, the past is really a messy thing. And if you look at it from a slightly different kind of perspective, um, things come out different. The story changes in terms of its capacity for our reflection for our evaluation and for our assessment. The second story, and this one is very personal to me, is in my senior undergraduate seminar, um, for some reason he made us read John Adams's diary. 
I think it, it had to do with it. It had just been published in paperback, four volumes. <coughs> um, two volumes of the diary and two volumes of Adams's restatement of the, the diary. Um, <laughs> But one of the, the phrases that, that stood out, and it's a phrase that's commonly repeated. Adam says when he's trying to decide whether he's going to be a minister or a lawyer. And he makes the decision to be a lawyer, um, mostly because he thinks it's going to make him more money. Um, but more tellingly, he tries to imbue it with a kind of um, quality of professionalism, that it's not just making money. In fact, he, when one of his clerks tells him that um, he needs to read all the, the materials on debt collection, so, because that's the big, the, the, the big item in, the, in, in their, their client, among their clientele, Adams writes back from London or Paris and he says, no, that, don't read the philosophers. Uh, anything you need to know about debt collection, you can find out in half an hour. But he also writes later, um, he, he writes a really telling thing. He says, I study politics and war, so my sons can study mathematics, natural science, uh, so that their sons can study porcelain and arts. <coughs> I at the time, well, not at the time, I, I am a first generation college student. I, my father was a cop, my mother was a secretary. I was the first in the family to go to college. I was supposed to become a medical doctor, but some, that, that uh, sort of disappeared along the way. Um, and that spoke to me. And it spoke to me in a way that said, if you look slightly differently at this, from the perspective of a little Chinese American kid from Hawaii. Um, it's the story not only of American upward mobility or American aspirations, but it's the aspirations of people who came to this country. And if the story of obviously a very, what became a very privileged white family <coughs> can also be a story that includes first generation children of color. It's that within that, the messiness of our experience, within the messiness of the history, that we can have different kinds of, of aspirations that include the stories of people who have largely been ignored. That is one of my very favorite John Adams quotes, and I think it speaks so beautifully to um, a lot of people's experience and intention. So we know here that fewer than half of our visitors come to Old North knowing exactly what it's famous for. We know that they associate it with the American Revolution and Paul Revere, or maybe they associate it with the colonial era more generally. In short, they may not come to Old North expecting to hear about people who are traditionally underrepresented in or about topics such as urban slavery. This is not what they're expecting when they come to our site. So that leads to a question that we've been thinking about and wrestling with here. What is our role? What role can historic sites have, like Old North, what role do we play in the transmission of hard histories? So I think um, historic sites can be the place where that conversation starts with the public. We see ourselves as a place where we can bridge between what you know the research that you know, scholars like Jamie and Jonathan are doing and presenting it to the public. We have been so moved and so impressed by the work that Jamie has done already and are excited to start to share some of those stories with people. And you all get to hear some of those stories um, tonight when you do the gallery tour. Um, but I think one of the things when I'm, when I'm talking with visitors here at the church, I'm always struck when you have visitors who are not from the Boston area or not from New England, and they come here and they visit the church and they say, it's real. The, you know, you've read about the American Revolution. 
learned about it in schools, but when you come here and you see these places, it's real. And I think that's something that we can really build upon, that these stories, um, again, you can read, you know, read about them. I think sometimes hard history becomes politicized, but here at Old North, they're real. And people can sit in the spots where these people sat, look at the items they looked at, listen to the clock that they listened to, and I think that's where these people really come to life and visitors can start to dig into the complexity um, of these people who were here at Old North and build empathy for them. Um, I also think uh, historic sites are really important, uh, are really important tools for, for education, for, for the classroom, that we can again build, um, bridge that gap for, for teachers too. Uh, I was talking earlier this week with a social studies administrator um, for the Boston Public Schools, and she was saying that she wanted to get students here because historic sites could be that third, that neutral third party for teachers who want to have those conversations with their students about hard histories, but don't know where to start or don't feel comfortable, or perhaps are getting pressure um, from outside parties about how to talk about that or not talk about that. Um, we know that in other states that legislation is being passed that really limit what teachers can talk about in the classroom. And so I think um, it really is important that historic sites like Old North are starting to tell these stories and talk about hard histories so that we can be still teaching children about that. And we have conversations like that every day here in the church. People who say, I didn't realize that, but now, you know, I've heard this story of this person and I, can, I have a better understanding. So Old North, of course, also has another identity and it's a very important identity. Um, it is still an active church and it has had a faith community for close to 300 years and next year is the anniversary. So, how does Old North's religious history and its ongoing role as an active Episcopal parish make untangling its hard history kind of a uniquely challenging experience? Not an easy question. Um, in some ways, Old North being an active religious institution operates in exact opposite from what an historian does. For religious institutions, it's the destination that shapes the journey. For the historian, it's the journey that shapes the destination. Historians kind of hope that when you arrive at the destination, you have a little extra perception, you have a little better sense of understanding that you grasp the complexity. Um, in many ways, history confronts and interprets evidence. It requires the historian, a good historian, to be absolutely ruthless in what they see and what they interpret of texts. Um, there's a kind of weird tension here because you usually know how the story turns out in some ways. Uh, for the historian, it's the task of explaining, and it's our explanations that actually change over time, as we decenter our perspectives, as we learn about looking at historians, at, at history from, from a different perspective, um, from the sensibilities, not of not so much of the, the dominant narrative, but of the multiple narratives and the creativity that a historian engages in is the way in which one gets at those insights. Um, this may or may not inform how an Episcopal or any religious organization carries on, but it's meant to provide a kind of humility, a sense of seeing the complexities and understanding the complexities. One of the reasons that this project um, is so fascinating is it, the, the courage to confront the past uh, uh, as, as, it, as it exists. Um, I have a story. Um, that, that, that's what historians do. We tell stories, um, but we change the perspective, we change the, 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 the line a little bit in order to explain or to present to you our explanation as a way of providing that kind of perspective. 
1882, George Frisbee Hoare, who is the second longest term serving senator, United States senator in the history of the Commonwealth, second, beaten only by Teddy Kennedy. So he, he was that for a long time. Um, he, I'm not sure what kind of character he is, and I'm not sure what my assessment of him is, right? Um, he was a strong supporter of sending Indian children to boarding schools, finance the, help put the money through to get those schools started, um, uh, gave scholarships. This was boarding schools that Native American children were sent to, um, and if they were properly <coughs> civilized, their hair cut, uh, put into suits, they would then become contributing citizens uh, to America. Um, so from that perspective, he's kind of not such a nice person. He also was adamantly opposed to the incorporation of the Philippines into the United States. Not because he had any sympathy for the Filipinos, but that he thought that incorporating all of these people of color into the United States would somehow mess it up. So he's adamantly opposed um, to immigration. But weirdly enough, in 1882, he's an opponent to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and there's a line in the speech, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but it, it's, it's what strikes me as the, this kind of messiness, um, which has all the kinds of things of why you need to rethink the past. Um, he looks out and he says, I, I remember when men in this audience, the, speaking to the Senate, whose hair was not gray. And what they're saying about the Chinese, they were saying about the Irish. So here's Hoare. He doesn't like Filipinos. He's kind of well-intentioned, but racist with regard to Indians. Um, but he likes the Chinese. Um, one of the things that Hoare also points out, pointed out to me in, in, in looking at this particular history and it's something that constantly amuses me because whenever I see it in something about immigration in the news, only the subjects of the sentences have changed. The predicates are still the same. I think it's that kind of insight, that kind of wisdom that ought to give people pause. It may not change what they feel about immigration policy, but it, may, it, it, it ought to make them think a little bit about it they could at least change the predicates. Jonathan, you always have a wonderful historical anecdote. I am so envious of your mastery. <laughs> so this one, we're gonna kind of go around the, around the panel. Um, so when our visitors leave, perhaps having learned a little more than they expected, including some really tough history. What's a successful outcome? Who wants to go first? I, I can go first. Okay. okay. Um, so the teacher in me wants uh, visitors to leave with a skill. And I think that skill is uh, the skill to ask questions. Um, I, we had a researcher here who used to say, um, you know, if people are leaving with more questions than they have answers, then we've done our jobs. And I think though these stories, uh, especially when you hear them, some of them on the gallery tour, uh, they raise questions for us. And I think it's by asking questions that we can start to uncover these stories. And again, I've been just so impressed by the research Jamie's done and the way she asks questions to tease out these stories. But they do, they leave us with more, more questions. But I think if we can teach visitors to ask those questions, to, um, to challenge the narrative and leave here going, to other sites and um, reading, you know, history critically, asking those questions. Um, then I think we've done our jobs. I, I Emily's right. Um, 
one of the benefits, not speaking as a, a public historian, <laughs> but one of the benefits of engaging in this kind of activity is that you learn more, um, that, that one learns to see, to see differently. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great uh, conservative philosopher, Michael Okshut, who talks about the process of questioning as the only way you become wise. Um, one can't think of being wise as an inherent characteristic, but something that one can actually learn, but by being honest, which is what a good historian should, should be doing. I know we're a little over time, so I'm gonna go quickly and say that for me as a scholar of gender and race, I think one of the most important things that we can do is to get beyond binary thinking. And I think this is the way that Catherine started the panel, talking about hard history forces us not to think good guy versus bad guy. <laughs> that type of narrative that we want to present. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? We wanna, you know, part of the challenge, I think even when we were putting together this panel, um, Jonathan, when you came and talked with us about it, we were talking about the challenge of U.S. history in particular, and I would say the history of the Americas generally, because there are not those kind of clear and firm answers, and yet we've been taught in school, this is the answer. Um, in 1775, immediately, all Americans felt like this, and that is absolutely not true. There is not a linear narrative of the past. We are still evolving. When somebody God bless their hearts. When I have students in the future who want to write about 2020 and the COVID pandemic, I can't wait to hear what they have to come up with because I'm sure they're going to try to come up with a linear, neat story. Americans felt like this, and that is just not the case. And so I think the same complications and tensions that people bring with them to this place, especially as we are increasingly living in a society that is more multiracial and more multicultural and people are of all different faith traditions and people are thinking more about disability and people are thinking more about what does it mean to be a man or a woman or a non-binary person. This place is a place where when we do hard history, we can open people up to think beyond these kind of binary categories um, that we tend to use to think about the past and even the present. And from my perspective, because I spend a fair amount of time in the church, I am always happy when people leave in conversation. It, when they leave and they're like, huh, and you see them talking to one another. Because to me, Starting a conversation is one of the best things that a historic site can do. It can take issues of the past and it can help people start to see a connection to the present and also help them see what they might want to do to change the future. And that's what we do here. <laughs>